Hello and welcome to another Idea Me episode. Today we're going to be talking about the enormous challenge posed by climate change and in particular the impact of our built environment. And it's not just heating and cooling our homes, offices and factories that causes environmental problems, it's the very act of building them too, with construction activity being a huge source of greenhouse gas emissions. I'm going to be discussing all this with someone who's been arguing passionately for decades that climate change is an issue that the construction industry needs to take very seriously indeed. Keith Clark has spent many years running various construction and engineering enterprises, including eight years as chief executive of Atkins, one of the UK's largest design and engineering consultancies. Keith, tell us a bit about yourself. No, uh, thanks, Neil. I mean, I, I've had an accidental career, um, fortunately. I started as an architect, um, went to New York, did economic development for the city of New York, which was, um, believe it or not, days pre-fax, let alone pre-mobiles, when um, uh, uh, the geographical competition wasn't China or, the, or India, it was New Jersey. So a completely different world of industrial stabilization and, um, and making a city transition. That was a fantastic eight years with uh, uh, an economic quango working for the mayor. And just, I mean, just an amazing opportunity, uh, which I would never allow anybody working for me to do that many things on their own. It was extraordinary. But then I worked for a developer, then ran a construction company, um, one of the UK's largest, and then um, ran the UK's largest engineering consultancy company. Um, which is fantastic fun. I mean, the whole, <laughs> but really all to do with cities. I have to confess I'm a city boy, born in London. Um, you know, I get nervous, so I'm not, haven't got six million people around. And the future is urban. Um, that's sort of my background. And now I'm sort of semi-retired, um, chaired a couple of charities, um, now chairing a uh, experiential learning uh, uh, construction area where we teach people how to build stuff. Um, and work together and talk to each other. Um, and um, the Active Building Centre, which is a government sponsored research programme um, and a few other odd things as you do. But I mean, fan it's, it is fantastically unpredictable career, um, which I'd always encourage for anybody. <laughs> it's the unusual surprises, which makes it much more fun. How did you get interested in the topic of sustainability and in fact, what do we mean by the phrase sustainability? Well, let's do the second bit. Nobody ever agrees on what the definitions are of sustainability. We all kind of have an image of it, uh, but everybody's image is like a Venn diagram. It all kind of overlaps. Um, uh, uh, and generally, I think there's a feeling that the world was running out of resources. You know, the WWF had the one world planet, one planet calculation years and years ago. Um, which has been sort of superseded by climate change being more pressing. Um, but the general issue of fairness and equitable and protecting the future for those who are not yet born um, is, is what it's about. And there's lots of, you know, Brunel, there's lots of people have done fantastic work on this. Um, but what sort of got me into it was actually I was always nervous about this general wishy-washiness of sustainability. And my children, actually, their activism moved me on it. Um, you know, I've got three, three girls, all of whom have forged their own um, careers in a way that I'd never be brave enough to, um, with values which are fantastic. Um, and I don't think I can take any credit for that. I think they've influenced me. And that sort of made me start to think about relating it to the stuff we were doing in the business. And you know, one of the great things about business, if, 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 if you give people dignity in what they're doing uh, and they're proud about it, um, you get a successful business. You know, their ability to do good work and enjoy it and go home feeling proud at the end of the week uh, makes money for the shareholders, bluntly. Um, it makes them uh, 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 happier. Um, it makes them more challenged. Um, it's fantastic. And you start to relate that to some of the bigger problems. And it became pretty clear you know, for me, certainly 15 years ago, that climate change was structurally different as an issue from all the other issues we'd been dealing with of, you know, uh, gender inequality, racial inequality, um, economic in inequality, uh, 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 the biodiversity issues, um, et cetera, et cetera, that climate or air quality. 
we had a structurally different issue. So your your daughters um, kind of inspired you to take um, take a hard look at the question of um, what was happening to the environment. Yes, and their awareness of society. And I think what what's really encouraging when you look at some uh, the students I talked to and the youngsters. Most people are younger than me now, but um, is their ability to assimilate these things and think that it is part of their their responsibility rather than somebody else's. Um, and I think, you know, the Extinction Rebellion, the school kids movement on climate change is about that ability to assimilate a really complex issue and realize it's not somebody else. It is us now. Um, and that's a big change. And I think. Um, so, you know, moving from sustainability to, to climate change, if you look at the SDGs, yeah. Sorry, all what of do you them mean by really, SD, Sorry. Ah, that, sorry. That, that, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Fantastic. Arguably that some of their metrics distort the way you do things, but that's true of any measurement calculation. But at least we have a global agreement on uh, 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 ecosystems and all sorts, you know, the 17 measures. But they're all somewhat dependent on do you get to four degrees or not? If you can get, keep it below what, to, to one and a half, you can actually achieve uh, uh, equality, water quality, uh, uh, biodiversity. And if you get to four degrees, you can't achieve any. Now, you mentioned four degrees. Um, you're, you're talking about here a, a, a rise in, in average temperature of four degrees Celsius. Uh, shorthand for um, uh, where we're currently going, which is in excess of four degrees. Um, and the Paris Accord said we would limit average global temperature rises to two degrees. And then we should look at, is it worth getting to one and a half degrees? Um, and the report in 2019, which was led by um, some fantastic groups of scientists, looked at, is it worth it? Is it worth the extra effort of decarbonizing that much more and how quickly? So it was a real sort of cost benefit social uh, uh, calculation. and. Rather disappointingly or alarmingly, not only did they come back saying, oh, one and a half degrees is really quite essential, not a nice option. It is, it is really essential, limiting it to one and a half. We're already at 1.1, 1.2, but we also need to do it quicker. Hence, all the declarations we're currently seeing of both governments, uh, which are the UK government declared net zero to be achieved for our economy, by 2050, China said 2060. Many private companies are saying 2030. Quite interesting, the private market is moving quicker than many governments on this. Um, and not because of their ethics. Um, you know, I've run a major company that's listed, um, depending on the private sector to be ethical, at scale is an interesting challenge. Relying them on them to manage risk and be greedy is a lot more predictable. And they're doing it because of risk. They're doing it because a world at that means your assets are not viable. So uh, think of Blackstone, BlackRock, you know, fantastic letters saying, we are looking at a major reallocation of capital, the like of which we've never seen because of climate change. And if you look at all the oil and gas companies, um, Total is now Total Energy, trying to stop being an oil and gas company and being an energy company. Um, BP, Shell, massive transitions. These are globally disrupting trends where people have understood now the landscape of climate change. Well, I'll come back to this issue of you know, why doesn't everyone get climate change? There's very good reasons why we don't get climate change. It is incredibly complex. You know, it is... It is not just technology, it's science, it's politics, it's human behavior with risk. And I have to say, we're all pretty appalling at evaluating risk. When things get too difficult, we ignore it. So we worry about, you know, people tell me, have a safe flight. They don't say have a nice safe taxi ride. The taxi ride is more likely to kill me than the flight. By a huge degree, we don't mention that. So there's a whole issue. And then you've got the more fundamental issue, unlike air quality. You know, we could fix air quality in London. We did it with the, with the Clean Air Act back in the 50s. You didn't have to solve the Clean Air Act in every city in the world simultaneously 
to improve the air quality in London. Climate change, everybody has to restructure their economy and change the way they use, generate, distribute energy, the way they use, generate food, the way they actually drive life. So there's no doubt in your mind that climate change is a huge issue, perhaps the biggest one of all. Can we focus perhaps a bit on a particular sector of this and that's the contribution or the challenge of the built environment yeah the buildings okay. that we use at the moment and those that we're about to build uh, what's the what are the particular problems in this sector i think uh, the built environment i divide into three sort of chunks um uh, uh, as being the systems of systems the infrastructure the stuff in the streets which provide energy, power, transportation, gas, sewage, you know, the stuff that comes to your building. Um, and then I talk about the buildings themselves and what they do and they perform. Uh, and then you have the uh, generators of uh, either recycling the waste that supply the energy or the goods to feed the system of systems that come through. So I'm ignoring, setting aside agriculture, a whole different area. Um, we. Uh, and we're using massive amount of materials. Concrete and cement is the most common material in the globe. Um, we are going to build in the next 15 to 20 years something the equivalent of four and a half to six Europe's somewhere in the world. As Sorry, we what, do actually, you mean by, what do you mean by four and a half to six Europe's? I mean, well, that, if you that, imagine that's... all the infrastructure and all the buildings that exist between Ireland and Poland and uh, Norway and Spain, and I include Britain in, in uh, Europe in this definition, a non-political definition of Europe, right? You imagine all the infrastructure systems, all the power plants, schools, sewage systems. Somewhere in the world, we're going to be increasing the urban population by about three billion. And we're also going to be increasing the number of people who are middle class middle class they get a fridge all right fridge means you have dependable power supply you have a choice of food not a freezer freezer for emergency you have a fridge you have light predictable energy you have a roof you probably have you have internet you have a choice you have reliable food supply where you can make choices to put in your fridge you're like you and me so three billion plus or minus hopefully you're going to get a fridge and if they get a fridge the way we've got a fridge in the top billion people in the world who are living pretty, you know, fantastic lifestyle. Look at me. I've got an internet connection. I've got a spare room. I've got an insulated wall here. I've got electric light. Um, I've got a, a gas fired boiler. I've got a car outside that's a plug in, but I've got choice. If the construction industry and the built environment provides the same environment, and hopefully we will give the quality to those people, as well as the bottom billion or two who have nothing, who live on less than what I spent on coffee this morning. OK, you've got to lift them up. You've got to lift up the poor. But if you don't deal with the new middle class as well and they get what I've got the way I've had it, we're gone. We're gone past four degrees and we all get nothing. So the built environment is the built environment, the way we build buildings, the way we manage the infrastructure that supplies them can actually stop us getting to one and a half degrees. In of itself, it won't make us get there, but it can stop us. And the decision times for these things are, are very different. Um, and the building, the, the industry business models are very different. So, you know, whereas the car industry has had 10 years to work out electric cars, they've been given standards, They've done huge investment in technology that is accelerating globally like you wouldn't believe. The largest electric car manufacturer is Chinese. Um, uh, India is going to chase up that, that scale. GM is saying that their trucks, their pickup trucks, the icon of the American V8, right, is going to be all electric. So that, that industry is moving. My industry is barely scratching the surface. We're talking about where we could have heat pumps. Heat pumps coefficient of efficiency, hopeless at the moment. So we need to be restructuring our industry really very quickly. And there's gonna be massive winners and losers in that. So the industry has hugely different design cycles and timeframes. So you want, to, you want to put nuclear in, that's probably a 20 year decision. If you look at Hinkley Point, we talked about that for 20 years. It's still a few years away from opening. 
um, the French four uh, 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 um, plants that EDF have been building are now, I think, 10 years late. So you put your bet on the table for nuclear, whatever you want to bet, one plant, two plants, three plants, and you're going to wait 10 to 15 years to see that bet mature. You want to put a bet on high speed two, which is a new high speed line in the UK. It's a bet you make now and then it comes out 10 years later. Solar farm, you can make a bet now. It comes out a year later. Wind farm, make a bet now offshore. It will come out in four to five years time. So you start to make these bets on technology. The consequence, it's a bit like having a big roulette table. You've got to put bets down and keep them there until the ball stops spinning. And some of the balls will take a long time to stop spinning. You have to hold your nerve. And some of them will be hopelessly redundant with luck by the time they're there. You know, canals were made redundant. Um, MP3 players were made redundant. Technology comes and goes. And we're not, we can't get to a perfect answer. You know, it would have been quite nice if the first phone I bought had been as smart as this one. Um, why is it I get a better phone every six months? There was a point when you didn't buy a laptop because next week was so much better than last week's. Well, that technology to roll out in the built environment happens much slower. So if you turn up with a fantastically great net zero boiler, heating entity, fuel cell, something, it might take more than an hour or two to get that installed in 50 million homes globally, 100 million, a billion homes. So those cycles of knowledge structurally are very different. We are seeing in other industries, um, people are talking about retiring the A380 uh, uh, large Airbus as being old technology, not suited for a low carbon world. Uh, it's only, it was only built 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So we can stop it and stop it being achieved and on the other hand, if we handle it right and we start to put in some interesting bets on technology and bringing through, interestingly, product manufacturers are really moving. They're doing some great stuff. The industry that installs them seems to be incapable of responding. Um, but for youngsters coming into engineering, this is a fantastic time. It, was, it should have been a fantastic time 10 years ago because we could have done this 10 years ago. And actually, all the talks I've given on it over the last 15 years, obviously, have had no effect whatsoever because we have the biggest problem we've ever seen. It is now a climate emergency. And the one thing I'd like to Sorry. Um, um, just going back to the, the, the question of the construction industry and how it can be persuaded to change. Uh, if, if you're looking at the way buildings are constructed, let's take the material, concrete, uh, cement, and so on. Um, are there new materials out there that could have less impact on, on the environment? And how easy is it to, to persuade the industry to start using these materials on a large scale? Right, just the whole material and product stuff is really um, fascinating. There is some really good research going on now with low carbon concrete. In fact, um, Kelpray, which is uh, a really good uh, contractor, piling demolition contractor in the UK, have a proper research arm and are using low carbon concrete. Doesn't get you to net zero, but it sure as hell starts to progress. And they've been using it in piles. We start, they're starting to use it in other places and for temporary works. One of the first things you can do, and some other contractors in the UK and I think abroad are looking at the same thing, instead of using concrete as a filler, a free, inexpensive, when in doubt, fill a hole with concrete, you can actually start to change the way you use what grade of concrete. In general, the habit has been, when in doubt, up the standard, go to a higher spec, greater carbon intensity, by the way, but who cared? And you use it for all sorts of temporary fill or blinding, which is sort of covering the surface. It's a nonsense way to use carbon. If you price carbon at any, anything remotely viable in terms of impact, which should probably be, you know, in the perfect world, $100 a ton for carbon, you would start to use it like a scarce commodity. So immediately you probably get rid of 20% of what you're using um, of the overall package. And then 
some of the major international cement producers um, have declared they will get to net zero as a product by 2050, even though they have no technology currently available to do it. And that to me is an incredibly encouraging sign that people are willing to stake the objective rather than waiting for a convenient viable solution. They're saying we will find a solution. I think there is a danger though. And um, the uh, chief medical officer of, the, of, of America came out with this um, when being interviewed, what's the greatest risk does he see to, to society globally? Um, and he didn't say COVID, although at that point, you know, more people had died in America than in the Vietnam War, Second, Second World War and the First World War put together. He said, it's the rejection of science. The rejection of science is a real danger. And we see that. And in the end, climate science is science. It's well established. It's been going on a long, long time, well before the beginning of this century, people were looking at climate science. Our ability to model that accurately now is unbelievable achievement. Because it's an inconvenient answer to our lifestyle and the way we want to heat our building and the way I want to insulate my windows, the way I want to travel, means some people, uh, you know, quite large numbers of people, certainly in America, um, simply deny the science. And I think that, you know, when it starts to change your, and the built environment and the way we run cities, that really brings it home. This is not some esoteric power plant off disappearing that has nothing to do with me. This is about your, your lifestyle, the way you pay for your energy, your, you pay for your modification of the environment, the way you travel, um, so it hits home. I think actually it was a great survey. Um, I think it was a UK survey that said how many people in the UK would support a carbon tax. Didn't specify how the tax would work. So lots of minor details, um, but something like 54%, 58% supported a carbon tax, uh, which is very encouraging. I would note, and I think Nick Stern, Lord Stern pointed it, this out as well. It's a bit like a diet. I'm on a diet, but this biscuit doesn't count. Um, and when it comes to carbon tax, I'm really keen on saving the environment, but I'm not changing my gas stove. That's different. You know, so the inconsistency in our own behavior, and it's a behavioral issue. Um, and the built environment comes to absolute crux. Can we change our industry? Yeah, I think we can. There's some people now, um, I think all the major design and engineering firms globally have signed up to race to net zero, uh, the UN science-based um, targets. Um, most of them are now wondering how to do it. Fantastic. Smart people, great at answering questions. And they've posed themselves the question. Contractors are beginning to follow, begin to struggle with biodiversity. Um, uh, there's some groups both here and in America which are really starting to make real progress in how they would think about that design process. I mean, I tell you the other thing that's interesting is that firms are telling me they can't hire student, they can't hire graduates unless they can articulate how they're dealing with climate change. Graduates don't want to work for a company that doesn't understand the magnitude of this change and can engage with them on this issue. Um, which is fantastic news um, uh, that students are coming out like that. I don't think our universities are teaching all the courses in the built environment to deal with this yet. I think the universities are lagging behind. The, the research around the world is fantastic. The ordinary courses in engineering have got a long way to catch up, both here in the UK and um, in the other areas I've dealt with. Um, and revolution is a revolution the way we run cities. You know, revolutions are not predictable. There's not going to be an orderly plan. Um, there's going to be, you know, suboptimal decisions made very, very quickly, I hope. And then in three years time, we go, oh, oh, if only I'd known. <laughs> that's called, that's called progress. You know, that's, <laughs> if you wait for the ultimate plan, the, 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 the key solution, the entirely predictable technology, you don't get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> How do you, um, so you express some optimism there that the construction industry is moving in the right direction, but is it moving fast enough? 
And how do you create a sense of urgency in the boardroom? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it's a combination of um, peer pressure. Um, I have to say, um, it, it, well, it doesn't apply to me, but most people are vain and have unconscious bias. I'm perfect, so you know, it doesn't work a bit, right? You know, we're we're all vain. We none of us want to be embarrassed by our peers. Um, you know, of all the human emotions, um, uh, peer pressure and not being embarrassed and and being sort of at the front and a winner for pride, and you know, is a pretty powerful motivator. Um, it really is more so than money quite often. Um, uh, and so you've got that and you've got to move now where people are seeing that it is essential. And a lot of people are, you know, have sustainability experts in their business. I think boards are finally catching up on it. Um, I was very fortunate at Atkins. I had a board that was very supportive of this 15 years ago. Um, I had Sir Peter Williams, who was, a, you know, un he got all the science. It was fantastic having someone like that on the board. Um, uh, and I think boards are beginning to realize this is not, boards have for a long time have understood, whether they're private or public boards, that sustainability and social inclusion and diversity was an issue, but it was sort of parked at the edge. And climate change comes into the middle. It changes the way you offer your services. It's not a sort of, we run our business and we give out t-shirts at the weekend, sustainability type nonsense, okay? This is core, this changes your business model, it changes your fee structure, it changes the way you guarantee your product, it changes um, the way you advise clients to procure it, it changes the way you train people, it is disruptive. And I think that's the big change I've seen in the last five years, and it's accelerating, that it's gone from being a thing you have to deal with and report on to core. Um, and money is driving it. You know, nine, 900 billion, I think it was, uh, of pension funds in the UK signed up to net zero in their portfolio by 2030. Um, globally, ESGs are reported. Uh, environmental, social and governance funds um, are, uh, have the biggest inflow of any funds, particularly in Europe. Um, massive change to how money, debt and equity is available um, to people addressing the climate change risk. And the, the key on that is not just talking about investment in renewable wind farms. We're talking about people looking at the risk in all businesses, in retail, in building, in development, in housing. Is it protected against climate change risk? Is it credible in terms of its own carbon footprint? That is coming through the door at a rate which I never believed would happen. It, 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 you can read it in the, in the financial papers every day. So you, are you, would you say that you're, um, you're more optimistic now about the response of the construction industry than say five years ago? Oh yeah, the accelerator, I'm much more optimistic than five years ago. There were some good people doing some great work, um, but they were good people doing some great work. Now I see companies struggling with it at mass. For years, all the big companies have had teams that could do net zero projects or close to it. Really, what they couldn't do is take, you know, out of say 18,000 people, have 18,000 people do them. A house builder in the UK, when I did a low carbon uh, review for um, the deputy prime minister of Mandelson, uh, Peter Mandelson years ago, um, probably 15 years ago, said, I can build, as the major developer in the UK said, I can build a net zero carbon house. I can't build net zero carbon housing, but I can have a team build a house. Doing it at scale is beyond the industry's capability. And what's changing now is rather than having odd teams who were fantastic high performers, it's doing it at scale. So the day of the exemplar project wasn't that great, weren't we good? That's simply not good enough. Now it's got to be every project struggling to up the game. And that's what companies are now dealing with, which five years ago, really most weren't. And that's true from the design firms, the architectural firms, the project management firms, the SMEs are trying to get on uh, and cope with this because it's pretty disruptive. 
Um, uh, the product manufacturers are you know, probably moving quickest of all. Um, the, a very complex industry we have, very disconnected, um, full of actually extraordinary characters, really entrepreneurial people who solve problems. Uh, construction is full of people, fantastic at solving problems. Are we good at avoiding them is a different issue. And are we good at transferring knowledge and R&D? Well, I think that will cause some shakeout in the industry. Now, I'm much more optimistic than five years ago. Um, the, the, the problem is that it should have been like that 10 years ago. <laughs> right. I mean, we don't have much time left. We really don't so, have much time left. If we don't have much um, time left, is, um, I mean, is the industry going to be able to move fast enough on its own? as it were, is it going to be able to make the changes necessary without pressure from outside the industry? Because, I mean, despite the optimistic examples you've given, I mean, as you say, this is a huge industry with a lot of entrenched practices. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if it's like, uh, if you compare it to, you know, a large super tanker, those things take a long time to change course, don't they? I mean, think yeah. of the um, th think of all those plants churning out concrete and cement. I mean, you can't change those overnight to producing low carbon materials, can you? No, you can't. And they're going to take probably um, a decade to get there. Um, but the amount of money um, going into that sort of R&D uh, is increasing and um, it's hard to see why the same sort of investments that are going into uh, electric planes, two, two recent SPACs, which are special purpose acquisition companies, which are in the press all the time now, uh, which are companies which float without a purpose and then buy someone to have a purpose. Two of them bought effectively uh, medium haul electric plane companies. Um, that's an investment and a bet in the future for electric planes, which don't have fossil fuels, presumably you have a fossil fuel, uh, non-fossil fuel energy supply in the grid, but you know, ma no air pollution, massive, massive technology bet. Those bets are going to start to happen in the production of steel and concrete and start to happen in the produ uh, production of hydrogen and the production of um, uh, large scale energy storage. Um, not just your, your lithium battery for your house, which we've got here. We're talking about seasonal variations. Um, we're going to see, I think, different technologies. Already we've seen a massive change in the way you have your light bulb. You know, we've gone through about six generations of technology to get to the LED that I've now got, which is dimmable. I can choose the quality of light and the color of light, which 10 years ago I couldn't. And, then, uh, and they last for 10 years. So those sort of technology revolutions are going to come through um, and start to come into how we build steel. We might use a bit more timber. I'm cynical about timber being the solution to everything. Um, I think there will be some very interesting surprises about what materials we use and how we use them. And one of the big questions um, for the developed world is rather than building new all the time, can we reuse the assets we've got? And rather than recycle, can we start to look at reuse of stuff? And some contractors are already doing that. They're keeping the uh, uh, inventories of material that they can reuse, not recycle. Um, there's some good stuff being done in Canada on bridges on that. Um, uh, for developed economies, that ability to milk what you've got to a higher level is very efficient. Inconvenient, because there's more design risk, more certification risk, and it's a harder thing to procure. A new something is sort of, you know, has a few really interesting characteristics. You get a ribbon to cut. Politicians like ribbons to cut. You have the ribbon disease. Have a new school. We actually could renovate the old one, save a shed load of carbon, and um, still play with technology. Yeah, but I want, you know, I want ego, you know. So the vanity thing we've got to address, um, and I think you can do that. You can just make it embarrassing to spend that much of the Earth's assets on something. It should be embarrassing, like it's embarrassing if I lit a cigarette now and started smoking. That would be kind of embarrassing. It might or might not be against the law, but you, you'd be embarrassed by my behavior. Or if I suddenly started drinking whiskey and soda in the morning on the, 
on this, you know, you you might think twice about that. <laughs> it's not gin, by the way. <laughs> so um, the key, to, one of the keys to this is changing behaviour in the in the boardroom and everywhere. Yeah, I think I think it is changing in the boardroom. I mean, one of the um, progresses which is slowly happening not quickly enough, I think, is the diversity um, that you need in the boardroom. Uh, diversity of gender, of ethnic background, of experience. Um, every board I've had, um, you know, we did it in Atkins long before the Davis report, which was a, a report in the UK about getting more diverse boards. Um, every time we've got a more diverse board, I less people that are like me, we've had better board discussions. I mean, it's just so obvious. All the data says you have more people like yourself, you all agree with yourself, and you all confirm your own bias. And we all have biases. So the more diverse the board um, in all sorts of aspects, the more fun it is and the more productive it is and the better performance you get. The real change is the middle management. When he or she, she's running you know, 50 people or a big project, um, she's got pressure from the chief exec, you know, people like me go and meet your budget, meet your budget, meet your budget. And the client is difficult and they've got staff to look after and some of the staff don't get on with each other or have issues and the training skills aren't there. They can't, the overhead's too big and, 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 you know, the really tough job is the middle management of most, most companies. Um, and they're the ones that have got, they're the ones that are going to deliver. You know, the board can issue policy in the end. It's projects. It's what you design on Monday. It's what concrete you do or do not pour on Tuesday. It's what you do put in the procurement spec. It's how somebody organizes the logistics. Can I get rid of half the trucks and consolidate? Can I engage with suppliers in language they don't yet quite understand? Really can't, and convince the client this is a better solution. Really tough, really tough on capital projects. Um, and that's going to be, I think, where a lot of the education and um, engagement needs to be. And we're seeing signs of that. We're seeing signs of companies, certainly in the UK, starting to do that engagement. I mean, I, I'm kind of optimistic. Um, and governments are moving. And I, I don't think there's... Um, I think there's a, the implicit in your question is who leads? And I don't think it's a, a leading. I think it's one of those things, it's a bit like line dancing. Um, everybody has to be moving. And in some cases, somebody will be dancing a bit quicker than others and others chasing, and then others will then get ahead and pull them. So I think there's a sort of dynamic um, and it's probably less like a line dance where we all kind of move in perfect unison than a Scottish reel where you throw people around and occasionally someone crashes into a chair, but it's vigorous. And you dance with people you don't normally dance with. That's the characteristic of climate change. Now, if we were to, let's take the construction industry and maybe compare it to a more, shall we say, directly consumer facing industry, like the car industry. I mean, that's the car industry is one that is very competitive it's trying to anticipate its customers' needs. It's trying to offer new features, things they haven't uh, thought they needed yep. um, in, in, in a race to get ahead. And is that something that the construction industry can do as well? Because if, if there's got to be a really strong push to change hearts and minds and sentiment about the issue of climate change, um, construction industry can't afford just to be reactive, can it? It needs to be proactive, doesn't it? Yeah, no, I agree. You can't wait for the market, just like you pointed out in cars. You have to anticipate what you're going to want, and then I persuade you it's a really good idea. Yeah, nobody went around saying, I need electric windows. Why can't I have electric windows? People did electric windows and said, isn't that nice? You know, oh, by the way, here's remote locking. Oh, by the way, here's GPS. Oh, here's, by the way, here's an automatic gearbox that really work. Um, you know, oh, by the way, it's automatic headlights. You don't have to bother turning them on. No one was going around saying, my life will get better if I had automatic headlights. You know? So 
Anticipating <coughs> those needs for the city and for buildings and for infrastructure is a tad more complex, but it is happening. And the great thing, I'm not the great thing, the good aspect of CO2E, <coughs> you turn it into a singular driver. I think for agriculture and uh, big infrastructure projects, biodiversity net gain is another complexity. So not to belittle that, you've got to deal with the biodiversity issue. But for most buildings on, in an urban context, CO2E, carbon dioxide equivalent, as greenhouse gas equivalents, is a really good singular driver of, of a new design parameter. It manifests itself in all sorts of ways. Can you reuse the structure? Can you add two floors to the existing foundations? Can you use the foundations in the ground? All of them are over design and not bother building new ones, just build on them. Happened in London on a major skyscraper. Um, increasingly, that sort of inconvenient question is fantastic. It doesn't quite get you to net zero, but it sure as hell stops a whole lot of carbon going in now. And the other characteristic, which we sort of didn't mention, climate change is different because it's time sensitive. So every ton we put in now is a bigger issue than not putting up a ton. So you don't need zero today, but every gain you can make today makes it easier to get to net zero in the future and stops what's called the overshoot, where we'll actually find a way of geoengineering stuff out of the, out of the climate, um, air capture, whatever, technologies that aren't proven yet, certainly not cost efficient. Um, as Nick Stern, Lord Stern said, you know, every time you delay, you double the cost of solving the problem. And that's probably more than double the cost if we don't reduce carbon now aggressively and meaningfully while we look for more and more uh, lower carbon solutions. So not using concrete now, using lower spec concrete now, while we work out a really sustainable concrete, it's an iterative process. Um, which is either exciting or frightening or both. I think, you know, for an engineer, he or she sitting there today with a problem, this is pretty, pretty tough. It's pretty tough. Fantastic. So we can respond. Um, we've got the skills. I mean, the, 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 the digitization of our industry is going to happen whether people like it or not. It is going to be disruptive. Um, it is going to have some suboptimal answers in the meantime. Um, it is going to make some mistakes. Um, uh, hopefully, with the quality assurance that we have in our industry, nothing falls down. Generally, it doesn't. Um, the issues we've had with quality, certainly in the UK, have um, been about standards. Um, and we have a disgraceful issue going on with fire protection in the UK and in one particular sector, which is housing. Um, all of those things will have to be addressed for all sorts of reasons, but climate change, decarbonizing at speed, at speed, means you really are going to disrupt the industry. So embrace it um, or get left behind. The governments are there, they're declaring. Society increasingly is saying we understand the risks. Look at Attenborough's programs. I mean, it's in the paper every single day. People are beginning to understand this is not a nice to have. It is fundamental, not to your grandchildren, it's fundamental to your children. And if you're young, it's fundamental to you. You want a pension plan that's worth it? You better decarbonize, otherwise don't bother. Don't bother. And you know, if you really think we're gonna to crack towards a four degree world, it's not a tenable option. It's not a tenable option. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm optimistic that between technology, behavior, people caring, people do care about the future. Um, uh, uh, people do care. And uh, I think that awareness of climate change um, and why it's not just sustainability, why it's just not, not doing things, why it's about celebration of life at the same time um, is a maturing discussion. I was, it, there's so much going on. It's just fantastic. A bit late, but fantastic. Pete <laughs> you know. Clark, thank you very much. No, uh, thanks for the chat. I mean, I wish I had an answer, but I don't. <laughs> thanks, Neil.